Political Trenches, local government at work, the show that delves into the municipal stories that are making the headlines from across Canada. Today, we are heading to the Yukon Territories to chat with the president of the Association of Yukon Communities, Ted Laking, about the state of municipalities in the territory. But before we do, we have big stories to dive into. So along for the proverbial municipal road trip is my co-host and co-pilot, Mr. Ian McCormick. Ian, it truly seems like it's been forever. How's it going? It's good. It's uh, I've been all over the place just off air. I was telling you, I've been literally from the West Coast to the East Coast, uh, from BC to Newfoundland since we last talked. So it's been pretty busy. And it's interesting you mentioned co-pilot. I was up flying for the first time the season yesterday too so it's all good there we go so we want to start close to home for both Ian and myself and we're going to be talking about a piece of legislation that was introduced in Alberta Alberta legislation pitched to protect provincial priorities could slow down grant funding and allow federal money to be spent elsewhere says officials representing municipalities in the province Alberta's Bill 18, which was introduced by Premier Danielle Smith in April, would require the provincial government to be to approve all federal funding to provincial entities. That would include federal money going to cities, towns, universities, and uh, from across Alberta. The province says the legislation is needed to ensure every municipality gets its fair share of funding. Minister of Municipal Affairs Rick McIver said, quote, Bill 18 is about getting more money for municipalities and Albertans in general. That's what we got elected to do. And by golly, we're trying to keep our promise, end quote. Ian, now I'm conflicted on this bill, to be completely blunt. I see this as red tape, red tape, red tape that municipalities will need to navigate. But yeah. on the other hand... I see this as the age-old problem. Municipalities are, quote, creatures of the province, end quote. And, and the federal constitution does not acknowledge municipalities at all. So the province has every right to say this is our jurisdiction, so you go through us to help municipalities. So the question I need to pose to you to kick this sec section off is, are municipalities stuck between a rock and a hard place here? Yeah, I guess so. Legally, anyway, or constitutionally, they are. And you were talking about being of two minds of this. I'm not really. I'm of one mind on this. That the I mean, the Constitution is what the Constitution is. I don't really see there being any appetite to open it up just for this particular issue because we all know that that's a long thread that people are going to going to pull. So, uh, I, if certainly the province is within its rights, I suspect, to do something like this. But I really don't think it is to the minister. You mentioned the minister's quote about the idea about getting more money for municipalities and in Bur Albertans in general. I don't think that's what it is um, with the funding cuts we've seen in Alberta over the last number of years from a variety of different sources. That doesn't jive with what people in the sector either see or what I'm hearing them say as well. So you can be on two sides on this one. I'll stick firmly to the side that this is a terrible idea. So let's talk about that funding aspect of this, because whenever I see a politician from a, a provincial or federal jurisdictions talk about equal funding, it always brings me back to, well, are you equally funding your municipalities? You're your partners right now. If you talk to members of RMA or even Alberta municipalities, they will tell you there is no equal funding going around for municipalities. So should the province not be looking at themselves before looking at the federal government to equally distribute the wealth of money that is going out to these municipal organizations? Definitely they should. And this to me is like collateral damage. I don't think this is aimed specifically, this change is aimed specifically at the municipal governments. I don't think there's any love between the province and local government, but this seems to be squarely aimed as a disagreement between the province and the federal government, or more specifically be between Alberta's Conservative Party and the federal Liberal Party. So the, in this case, it just happens to be municipalities. We've seen other things in Alberta as well. Uh, health, for example, has, has taken an impact because of the relationship between the provincial government and the federal government as well. To me, this is, you mentioned red tape, and I think that's a really interesting insight because the requirement for municipalities then is that they have funding arrangements between the federal government and the municipalities which kind of skip over the province, now be approved by the province. 
And of course, that means that the municipalities probably have to do a lot more reporting to the province, generating more red tape from a government that has a department, I think, that is a, says it's supposed to be cutting red tape. So there's a little bit of a hypocrisy here. If you like, I'll go straight out and I'll call it Orwellian paternalism. That to me, this is not something that works well in this in the theme of democracy, um, of representative government. Is it legal according to the Constitution? Yes. Is it good governance? Absolutely not. So the, the, the main sort of objection that the Premier was talking about when this came out was, well, Quebec's doing it. So in Quebec, the federal government has to go to the province before they work with municipalities. This is basically right. just transposing what's happening in Quebec into Alberta. Um we are both in Western Canada right now, and often we, we there's there's a negative light whenever there's something talking about when we're talking about Quebec. But in this case, the premier is saying, well, Quebec does it, so why shouldn't we get our uh, the same treatment like Quebec does? Does she not have the right to say that, to say, well, Quebec's getting this treatment where you're only working with the provincial government and not every other municipality, so let's work yeah. with the province of Alberta and not every other municipality? The premier and the government have a have a have a bit of a trend of saying of, of choosing their allies situationally. There's many times as they will beat up on Quebec as they will ask for Quebec advocacy. If we look at things like the um, carbon tax, for example, and which provinces are uh, in on the federal arrangement, and which ones aren't. If we look at things like the ten dollar a day daycare, which provinces are in and which provinces are aren't. There's a big Venn diagram on all of those things. Alberta overlaps with a variety of different places based. It's situational. So, and the, I mean, the arrangement between uh, Quebec and the Constitution is different as well. So different than, than Alberta and the other provinces. So I don't think that this is necessarily comparing apples to apples. It's not. But the only reason I mentioned it was Quebec is because I was just recently in Manitoba to, at the Association of Manitoba Municipalities Conference and SUMA at the Saskatchewan Over Municipalities Association Conference. And I can tell you, they knew I was from Alberta. And that was the first thing that most municipal, <laughs> municipal leaders wanted to talk about is how is this going to impact municipalities? Um they were watching this because traditionally what happens in Alberta starts to spread into other Western provinces. I'm not sure with uh, Manitoba, but they are watching with bated breath to see if this does go through. And if it does go through, quote unquote, successfully, uh, we could be seeing this in potentially Saskatchewan and other municipalities. So that's my end statement on that. Do you have anything to add before we move on to our next story? Well, only that I would not be surprised to see Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan and Alberta seem to tag team each other on these sorts of things with the change in Manitoba from the Stephenson government to the canoe government. I, I doubt that they would follow along on something like this to in lockstep with the Prairie provinces, but who knows for sure. I, I'm not on the inside of any of those governments. So as we're talking about Quebec, let's head to Quebec for our second story. More than 700 people have signed a petition asking for the return of Western University's French immersion school to trois Pistoles, Quebec. I apologize if I pronounced that name, that community name wrong. The remote town located 250 kilometers from Quebec City has been an ideal setting for Anglophones wanting to learn French in an immersive setting for over 90 years. But faced with a dwindling number of host families, the school announced last fall it was suspending the 2024 session and had put the program, quote, under review to assess the way forward. Now, the mayor, Philip Gilbert, formed a committee and of residents and at the end of February launched a petition to mobilize support in the town of 3200. Quote, we are worried, said the mayor. Quote, I hope we will be able to convince Western to keep that program alive in 2025. We really want to show how much the French immersion school in our community is important. It's kind of in our blood, end quote. Now, outside of the canceled summer session in 2024, the mayor said that the only other time that the school was forced to suspend activity was during the pandemic in 2020. Now, Ian, it wasn't until I was in Manitoba earlier this month when I started hearing about on the ground about how schools in communities can help municipalities thrive. When a school like Western University, or in that sake, when a business decides to close up and move on, it can be detrimental to smaller rural communities that rely on them. 
While I applaud the mayor for his work and his advocacy on this file, is the mayor not screaming into a void and hoping that by some miracle the school might reconsider this move? Is that a question or a statement, Chris? Both. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a, I, I, you're, you know your point there that is one I hadn't really thought about before this, and that is to me a thriving community is has a re bunch of different requirements. There has to be a an employment pool. There has to be an education pool. People are there for recreational, cultural reasons. People are there for faith reasons. I mean, there are some people there who are completely detached too, but the whole community contains all of those things. And if a smaller municipality loses its high school, it's seen as a, as a nail in the coffin. If a business closes to what you have said, it's seen like a nail in the coffin. In this case, it was a unique niche, I think, that Trois Pistoles had chosen to uh, cultivate, I guess, over the years with the university and beyond. Being known for something like this, I think is really a neat way of doing it. I'm sure it's a big undertaking. You were In the article, they talk about the aging population and I'm sure, and taking on the role of host family in something like this is a, is a large undertaking. I've done it um, through an immersion, sorry, through exchange programs half a dozen times and hosted people, it's a lot of work. But I think the benefits are certainly worth it if they can make a go of it. They are building the town. They're building the community. They're spreading it far and wide. It's like a diaspora of people who have been in this town and now have gone throughout the country and probably have some really great memories, most of them, I suspect, both of, from the host families and from the students as well. So I'd love to see this thing continue. Education. We, we talked about jurisdiction in the first story, so we're going to talk about a little bit of jurisdiction here. But this is not in a uh, municipal jurisdiction is education. But the mayor seems to think that this is a lifeblood for his community, because like you said, it is a unique a niche program that not everyone may know, but a lot of people may take advantage of. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the jurisdiction of education when you realize that a post-secondary education like Western University can come and go as they please. They don't have to sit around because the mayor says you need to stay here. No, absolutely they don't. And I don't even know that it's a jurisdictional issue in this case, different provinces, different orders of government, if you want to even consider. This seemed like a uh, like a symbiosis, that there was a, the, the Western was looking for a place to do something like this. The town was receptive to it. So I don't think there is a push and shove here I, I, the, the, that the mayor would speak well of it and want it to continue to me speaks well of the program uh, and speaks well of the history it's got within the town. Mayor's looking at the best long term interest for his community, and this is a way of going about doing it. So kudos to him. So before we turn to our last story, I have a simple question to ask you here, Ian. If I gave you a map of Canada, could you find love for me? <laughs> <laughs> I've been to hell, but that's in the Caribbean. No, no, I, I I couldn't actually, Chris. Well, a small Saskatchewan village is looking to put love on the proverbial map by becoming a unique wedding destination. Marvin Torwalt, who is known as the resident love historian, said to a reporter from the Canadian press that, quote, Everyone should be in love at least once in their lives, end quote. Now, the Village of Love is fully embracing its name with a new wedding chapel. It will give couples the chance to share their love in love. Now, the Village of in, village Northeast of Saskatoon, with a population of 72 lovers, had, a, had for years received letters and requests from lively lovers looking to tie the knot in love. The idea for love spread and streets were renamed to things like Lover's Lane, Valentine Avenue, and Heart's Delight Street. People from all over traveled to the community after Cupid's strike, but there was nowhere official to exchange their vows. So the mayor of love says a few years ago, they decided to take things a step further and fully promote the passion in their namesake. Through a lot of hard work, donations, fundraising, and generosity from current and former lovers, that vision is becoming a reality. While love is looking to the future, it is certainly connected to its area's rich past, though. The chapel building was an old Canadian Pacific Railway bunkhouse from nearby Choiceland that was donated. It was gutted and refinished. 
in the steeple is a donated Canadian National Railway bell. So Ian, I love that love is loving love. We are just off tourism week here in Canada where municipalities have tried to promote their uniqueness. Love has certainly taken their uniqueness of their name and ran with it. Are you hearing from other municipalities in Canada or from administrations of municipalities that they are trying to brand themselves in a unique as a unique destination or with a hook to bring in that elusive tourism dollar? Or is this love for love just a lovely idea for one small community in lovely Saskatchewan? Do you really want me to have this? You're just on a roll here, Chris. That's some more, I guess. I love the story too. It's, yeah, I, they've chosen to do something tongue in cheek. Uh, they've chosen to make something out of what they already have. And I think it's fantastic. Whenever I get a chance to work with a municipality, I, I, I say to them, if they're in the same province, that they ha have the same municipal structures and same legislations as everybody else. So what is it that makes you unique? And these <laughs> these guys have gone this particular direction, and I, I hope it really works. A lot of other places in Western Canada, of course, have gone with the unique big object, right? The world's largest everything that we've had a chance to run into. And maybe we that maybe that's another series for us, Chris. So to make, and a lot of it's to do with tourism. They know they're not going to get people moving to love Saskatchewan because of this. But people might drop by, might buy gas and a few groceries and stop for lunch. Great. Fantastic. The same thing could be said for Donalda, Alberta, and the world's largest oil lamp, right? Nobody's going to move to town because of it, but it's a neat little talking point, and it's it's just done in fun, and it makes the place unique, and hopefully it makes people want to come visit and have a have a warm fuzzy feeling about the place. So, good on love. Well, you you know me, and I like tourism, and I like traveling, and I like visiting right. these communities. So, I had not even heard of love prior to this. I've heard of love, but I didn't hear of love. If you know what I love, love. So, <laughs> keep going. When, when when I heard this story, I was like, okay, next time I'm in Saskatchewan, which Suma con Convention next year in 2025 is in Saskatoon. So maybe I will be taking a trip to love after I go visit Saskatoon for Suma in 2025. But I think this. This is just a lovely story. And we we often don't talk about the the good things that are happening in municipalities. And I wrote a story about this recently, but this is a great story. This is a story that has put this community on the map. And I, I've when I researched love on the internet, love Saskatchewan, <laughs> I should say, I will say that the abundance of this story coming from all the way from St. John's all the way to Vancouver Island, it has just like spread like wildfire and it has put love on the map. So maybe now I can show you a map and you can point to love for me there, Ian. So with that, we'll be right back with the president of the Association of Yukon Communities, Ted Laking. Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Ted Laking, President of the Association of Yukon Communities and Counselor for the City of Whitehorse. The Association of Yukon Communities serves as a unifying force for the diverse communities across the territory. With a mission to foster collaborations, the association's goal is to further the establishment of responsible government at the community level and to provide a united approach to community ambitions. The association assists communities in their endeavors to achieve and sustain strong and effective local governments, thereby improving the quality of life for all of the people of the territory. Through the advocacy, networking, resource sharing initiatives, AYCs empowers local leaders and promotes sustainable development, cultural preservations, and equitable access to services. From May 9th to May 11th, the Association of Yukon Communities will be gathering in Dawson City for their 49th annual convention and AGM. With that, Ted, welcome to the Political Trenches. Great. Thanks for having me back. So before we get into the crux of the of the show, let's kick it off with a simple question. And that is, what is the state of municipalities in the Yukon today? Yeah, well, I think that uh, one commonality that we have going on with all municipalities across the country is just the state of the financial sustainability of our organizations. Uh, we've uh, we're currently operating under an aged model of governance, 
and that uh, is really rooted in the 1800s. And what we're finding is that the over-reliance on property taxes, particularly from residential property tax uh, payers to uh, sustain and fund all of the significant challenges that we have as municipal governments isn't going to keep up for the long term. And what we've been doing through the Association of Yukon Communities is really trying to raise that red flag so that other levels of government can do their part to help us address this before it gets to mission critical. And we start uh, having uh, essential pieces of infrastructure that need to get replaced or fixed or built that uh, simply there's no money available to municipal governments. We're starting to get there. We're starting to see uh, some pieces of infrastructure in Whitehorse, for example, there's this uh, access point on the south end of town called Robert Service Way, which is the main way in and out of the downtown core of the city of Whitehorse for the south end of the territory. And it has been experiencing landslides for the last uh, two or three years now. And we estimate that the cost to fix that is going to be 60 to $70 million. A small community of 32,000 people can't, can't uh, realistically cover that on its own, but it is an essential uh, artery in and out, both for safety reasons, uh, you know, think of wildfires and escape plans out of a community, but also you know, accessing through um, the EMS to get to the southern end of the city, uh, or even just economically uh, for uh, traffic coming in and out of the south. And then just one other big one that's recently come up that wasn't on our radar, uh, as recently as three years ago, was we need a new water treatment plant, it looks like, in Whitehorse. Uh, we're starting to see uh, some hits of uh, and not live giardia, but dead husks of it, which means that we're estimating we're going to need about $60, $70 million to build a new water treatment plant for the community because our water wells that we've been relying on uh, won't uh, um, be there for the long term. And so particularly, we also need that to support all of the uh, a massive growth that we're seeing uh, throughout the country, but we're also experiencing it here in Whitehorse is one of the fastest growing cities. And as a result, the territory is one of the fastest growing jurisdictions in the country. And so there's a whole host of, of um, things coming down the pipe that we, we see because we go through our budgeting processes, but the other levels of government don't uh, necessarily see. And so that's what one of the big focuses that we've had as an association is making sure that the governments at uh, the other uh, levels are considering these uh, these things as they make their planning decisions as well. I'd like to throw a couple of questions your way too here, Ted, if I can. You made the reference here to infrastructure funding, and before that you were talking about some of the examples that you're seeing in Whitehorse. But um, of course, you're representing all the Yukon communities. Are you seeing similar infrastructure issues or maybe I'm not sure if I'm putting words in your mouth when I say climate change related issues throughout the territory? Yeah, th I mean, I think that there's obviously uh, infrastructure issues in all communities associated with climate change, but not just with climate change. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you need to remember for our communities is a lot of them haven't even seen the infrastructure that southern communities have seen. And so as they grow, they're starting to need infrastructure that other communities have taken uh, uh, for granted for years. Think of things like rec centers or, or pools, th things that are, you know, you don't generally think of as, uh, hey, this is uh, an essential piece for a community to exist. But really, if you want a community to grow and you want families to stay there, you need to think about things like this. And so some of our communities that are just starting to grow and get to that sort of critical mass that would merit having uh, a community pool or, or a recreation facility. They need that initial investment. But yeah, with climate change, uh, not just Whitehorse has seen it, our, our community of Teslin has seen flooding, community of Dawson has seen flooding. The community of Mayo uh, was uh, evacuated last year due to wildfires. And so we are seeing um, significant impacts due to it. And yeah, my obviously my experience is deeply rooted in my time as a city councillor in Whitehorse, so I can speak with a lot more authority on uh, the infrastructure needs of Whitehorse, but that's not to diminish the needs in the communities. I know one thing in particular that many of the communities have indicated is, that they need 
is with all of the demands being thrown in with growth and with immigration, they need significant new investment in underground infrastructure such as water and sewer. And um, so that these are the types of challenges we're seeing. And just to circle back to the, the infrastructure pots we're seeing, we're not, we're always, we're, we're never going to say no to new infrastructure funding. We're always excited when a new infrastructure fund is rolled out, but the new infrastructure funds that are being rolled out are not going to do the trick when it comes to our needs. And, and if, if I'm saying that, I'm assuming that that's coming, uh, uh, probably a similar message coming across the country, because I can only imagine what, uh, you know, uh, large cities are, are facing, let alone, uh, you know, rural communities in northern Saskatchewan that don't even have road access. So this is a, a challenge and, and we need to all uh, come together to face it. I, I, I say we as the royal we as the provinces in, uh, under the 49th parallel often take it uh, take for granted sort of the collaborative work that municipalities play in uh, sort of the distance from each other I'm, I'm here in Calgary and Chestermere Airdrie uh, Okotoks even uh, Bragg Creek surrounds us and there's a lot of feeder communities in the Yukon you are spread out and I say that as in the royal you as in your municipalities go from one corner literally to the other and it's few and far between there is a collaborative effort though in the yukon from my conversations with some of your uh, uh, mayors and councillors that you rely on first nations communities with other municipalities who are close to you do you see a more collaborative effort between your uh, member communities and even the First Nation communities of the Yukon territories when you're addressing some of these pressing challenges? Because if the, the territorial government, and the federal government aren't going to come to the table, you have to look at other options and working together is better than working alone. Yeah, that's a, it's a really great question. And um, this is actually one area that I'm quite proud of during my tenure as president is we've established what we call the Chiefs and Mayors Forum. And that brings together the mayors and the chiefs uh, of the Yukon. And the first ever one was held in October and we just held the second ever one last week. And it's an opportunity for our uh, community leaders to meet and discuss uh, issues of importance. So, uh, you know, you can't really fit it all into a one day uh, agenda. And we try to fit as much in as possible, but um, you know, we're all, we've, we've found even after two meetings, we've run out of time both times, but, you know, for example, I'll take the first meeting, for example, that's last October. And we really put a focus on the healthcare issue that I referenced and in particular substance abuse, the opioid crisis. And one of our communities, Mayo, Yukon has been particularly hard hit by this. I think that, um, they may have, uh, if not the highest per capita, death rate as a result of opioids in the country. And it, it's had severe impacts on the communities. Everybody's hit by this. Everybody knows somebody that has either uh, been lost to this or, um, you know, is friends with them. And so they, uh, what we did at the Chiefs and Mayors Forum is we took a united voice and we wrote uh, myself and the Grand Chief of the Council of Yukon First Nations we wrote a, uh, a letter to the premier asking them to take uh, more urgent uh, um, measures to address this. And so these are the types of things that we exactly, as you said, uh, when we're having trouble with the territorial, the federal governments, maybe putting the proper amount of attention on an issue we think is important. We believe we can come together and we are louder as uh, one voice. And we can be a, a pretty big voice for change. And, uh, you know, this past week, what we focused on was wildfires. We're coming into the wildfire season. We have presentations from uh, a local organization, Yukon First Nation Wildfire. And we had uh, presentations from the government to Yukon. And I'll tell you, it was, it was a, a two-hour discussion. It was frank. It was open. It was honest. And uh, I was pretty proud of the, the mayors and the chiefs. They really, they, they grilled the, these guys on... Uh, on how they're preparing because we've seen what's happened in other jurisdictions and you know we're very lucky we were we dodged a bullet uh, as we see it last year in the Yukon uh, but we're surrounded by forests as well and we're not going to dodge bullets forever and so we need to be ready and we know our citizens are concerned and so absolutely we're going to continue to to press the importance of uh, the having our two levels of government work together.
How do you attract people into Yukon? And to I mean, to your job as well, how do you attract them into being interested in either elected or appointed roles in local government in Yukon? Yeah, well, you know, it's almost like one of those, I don't know what the secret sauce is up here in the Yukon because we don't seem to have any trouble attracting anyone. <laughs> it's, I don't know if it, it, it's a beautiful place. And Chris is going to see this in a couple of weeks when he's up in Dawson, but it is, it is absolutely stunning up here. If you love the summer, this is the place to be. Uh, you know, you're living in, in many of the communities. You are out in untouched trail territory of like boreal forest within five minute drive of your uh, of your uh, back porch. So that's fantastic. Um, the housing is a struggle up here, but you know, it partly it's a struggle up here because the growth. Like I said, we're we're one of the fastest growing jurisdictions in the country. Um, so as for recruitment efforts or trying to, to get people uh, here, I, I don't see that as a challenge. I think whatever we're doing is working and that's great because we have a labor shortage as well. Last year, AYC, we passed a resolution to ask the territorial government to do some research into the possibility of extending the right to vote to permanent residents. And that was really with uh, brought forward with the recognition that uh, permanent residents are integral members of the community. They, they pay taxes, they often own uh, or run small businesses, uh, are a huge component of addressing the labor shortage. And, you know, they're, they're growing a segment of the population. And so uh, the, the government of Yukon's taken that and is doing some, uh, I think, cross-jurisdictional analysis. That's one way to do it. Another discussion that uh, is being brought forward at our AGM in Dawson is a similar concept, but this time around uh, the voting age. And so there's lots of discussions about does that expand um, interest in municipal government, but also one thing that this uh, that AYC has uh, taken an interest in is being more vocal and more visible. So we are more involved in the community either at uh, major events. Um, you know, we've uh, recently, there's this thing called the Arctic Inspiration Prize, which uh, it sponsors or uh, rewards entrepreneurial groups from across the territories uh, for unique ideas such as uh, arts and culture or uh, traditional knowledge. And so this year for the first time, the Association of Human Communities nominated uh, a group for that. And so um, we're, you know, we're fingers crossed that uh, when the awards are doled out in a couple of weeks, that uh, there's some good news there. But these are the types of ways is that we want people to realize that, uh, you know, it's this, the city or the municipality doesn't just exist when your property tax notice comes at the year and you can shake your fist at the cloud and curse us. There's a whole lot of things that we do that are important. As I mentioned, recreational facilities. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I think Chris asked me the first time we did this interview, what's the thing that you're most surprised about and you weren't expecting? At the time I said waste management. I'm changing my answer today. Today, <laughs> it is traffic calming, in particularly in residential neighborhoods. I, I've heard so much about people speeding uh, down a boulevard in an area, um, you know, I would say traffic, I wasn't surprised about, like, you know, gridlock and, you know, it takes me 30 minutes to get to work or whatever. That's probably on the low side for Calgary, but for Whitehorse, that's 30 minutes is a lot. Uh, but it's it's the small sort of low-hanging fruit things like, or, hey, this, this stop sign, I don't like it where it's placed, it's a blind spot. It's these types of things. And and I get, a, I, I really enjoy those ones actually, because those are relatively easy problems to fix but they mean a lot to people and they, they really feel like, uh, you know, wow, you know, the city council listened to me on this and, you know, we got a speed bump in front of our house and that is going to make our kids safer. And I think it's those types of things. And then that kind of word of mouth that gets out there that your municipal leaders and, uh, are listening and, and addressing and people kind of, I think will get more interest in like, Oh, I can make a bit of a difference. And, um, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's the small things, but that's okay. 
Um, Ted, uh, we want to thank you so much for joining us today on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Uh, you are a wealth of knowledge, and we will certainly have the open invitation if you ever want to come back on and talk about anything to do with Yukon community. So thank you so much. So our full interview with Ted will air next Wednesday. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break. <laughs> Ian, another great episode. We just traveled to the Yukon virtually to speak with the Association of Yukon Communities President Ted Laking. How do how do you think the episode went today? In a, in a similarity to a lot of the episodes we do, and we get to talk to local leaders, he was very passionate and well spoken, and obviously knew what the heck was going on and what's important to people who live in Yukon and elsewhere as well. So, those are always great to see the passion that we get out of people. So we were off for three weeks and we're going to be back next week with the full interview. But what do you have coming up here? Because I, I've got a lot of journey, as we've talked about. I'll be heading up to Dawson City. I'll be back in Brandon by the time this airs. What about yourself? What, what's on the agenda for strategic steps? Well, I've uh, just come back from a week in Gander uh, in Newfoundland last week or so. And next in a few weeks, I'm off to Kenora for a few days as well. So... That's the bulk of my widely dispersed travel. There's a bunch of things going on in Alberta as well. So we we know we're getting ready for some local conferences like the uh, Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, which is coming up in the next six weeks, I think. And Local Government Administrators Association of Alberta is coming up as well. It's conference season around here. Make sure when you go off to Kenora, say hello to Councillor Bellingham and Councillor Koch because they came on the cross-border interviews and they're right. great counselors. So when you're there, make sure you say hi and go see one of their favorite, uh, one of the best, uh, I would say, highly recommend city halls in downtown Kenora. I was there. Highly recommend it to anyone. Ian, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you and talk about the municipal issues that are going across Canada. So until next time, always a pleasure. It was a lovely time to talk.